Hi, everybody. Welcome to Business Computing Weekly. This is episode number 380, and it's recorded on... Whoop, we, and we got some background noise already here. Hang on here. <laughs> it wouldn't be Business Computing Weekly without something like that happening. Okay. Okay, there we go. All righty. Uh, anyhow, thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Bruce Naylor, your host. With me, as always, is Mr. Jack McLean of Complaints Computers. And we are hopefully going to have a good show for you tonight. Uh, we are going to be talking about some real problems going on with Microsoft. Is this Steve Ballmer's nightmare scenario? And then we'll be also covering uh, the demise of the free version of Google Apps. Okay, But I want to let everybody know we are sponsored by GFI Software. And uh, there's a new version of Viper Business Edition. Viper six, business, it's Viper Business Edition 6.0. And the new premium version now has uh, not only anti-malware, antivirus capabilities, but also patch management. So now Viper will also keep your third-party uh, applications patched and updated, things like Adobe Acrobat, etc. And you can learn more about that by going to my website, frugalbrothers.com, and picking up on that. I think you'll find it uh, really, really useful. At any rate, we hope we have a good show for you tonight. As I said, we got Mr. Jack McLean. Jack, how are we doing tonight? Uh, a lot better. A lot better. All right. Yeah, you were kind of under the weather. The flu is going around. Uh, we, we got a bunch of that going around here. Stomach, so let's get, <clears throat> yeah, let's, let's get right to it. Steve Ballmer's nightmare is coming true, I, and, I'm, and I'm basing this on a rather lengthy article done by Business Insider. It's one of my favorite reads, by the way. And, and there's different points on this, and so we're going to start with the first one. And that is the iPad is really eating the consumer PC market. And, and that, I find that kind of interesting, but sales are down of PCs by 8% year over year. And uh, I, I think uh, uh, in, in, in the U.S. alone, sales were down 14%. And Apple, if you add the iPad on top of the Macs, handily outshipped Lenovo. Uh, they outshipped, um, who else did they outship there? Uh, 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 most of the uh, major. Most of the manufacturers, I guess. Uh, if they, not all. Uh, I don't know about Dell. I don't, I don't see that in the article. But definitely uh, Lenovo would ship 13.7 million they, pieces. Uh, I think they shipped uh, 14 million iPads alone. Yeah, 14, about 14 million iPads. This is bad news. This is bad news for companies like Microsoft and Intel. Mm -hmm. um, and this was not the plan. If, if we recall, uh, Microsoft was going around talking to the manufacturers, and, and the hope was that they would see a rebound. Because here we are going into the uh, holidays. Well, we're here. We're in the holiday season. And we didn't see that that pickup. I think I've seen somewhere where sales were actually down 21% mm -hmm. of, of PCs uh, uh, year over year. That's bad news for Microsoft and doesn't really bode well for stock price or uh, Steve Ballmer's future. What, what's your thought? Do you think the – now, let me ask you this. Is it fair, is it fair to include the iPad with – PC sales. I mean, uh, or I, you, do you think that's fair, Jack? I think I think it's fair when a when an iPad is chosen over a PC, and I think a lot of people are making that choice now. Uh, so I don't no, I don't think you can fairly compare an iPad to a PC uh, desktop PC uh, necessarily. But if it's if it's killing a PC sale. Uh, if someone is in, you know, a Best Buy or whatever, and they're looking at a Dell desktop system, and they're looking at an iPad, and they're thinking, you know what, I can do what I normally would do on this desktop system with this iPad, and it kills that sale, then yeah, I think you can compare it along those lines. I think it's uh, it's costing uh, a lot of uh, a lot of regular PC sales. It definitely is. Um, so, so in all fairness, then, if Microsoft sells a Surface mm -hmm. a tablet. Um, that's a, the same thing as a PC sale. Well, I think it's a it, it, it is a computer. It is a you know it, mm -hmm. it you know it's not a uh, you're look you're looking at a different form factor, but it's still a computer, and it's still going to be used to uh, uh, to get work done. But 
regardless whether you, you consider work being messed with a, a spreadsheet or if you consider work uh, sending and receiving email and uh, doing eBay, it's still work. Uh, you know, you're still using it for work. So yeah, I think it's a, it's a fair comparison. Um, you, you made a remark a few minutes ago that um, this is uh, Balmer's nightmare. Um, I, honestly, I think Balmer is Microsoft's worst nightmare at this point. Uh, <laughs> I, I, just to be honest, I, you know, you named off all these things that are happening, and I really, I'm not sure uh, Steve Balmer even realizes what's going on at this point. I'm not sure he does. He, he's so excited about these new products, and I, I don't think he really, uh, I think Balmer is one of the biggest problems with Microsoft at this point. You have a, uh, you know, you, you have this guy in charge of this company, and I don't think he has a clear, uh, 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 a clear vision of actually what, what's actually going on in the real world. I think he's in his own little, uh, his own little box in his own little world that uh, hadn't existed since 1998, and um, I, I really, I, I think he is a major problem with Microsoft. I think another thing also that's uh, hurting Microsoft more than anything is their promotion. I don't think they're they're promoting the uh, the surface uh, the way they need to be. I, I don't I don't even see it as a bad device. Well, I, I'm glad you brought that up because Microsoft announced that they're going to increase the distribution of the Surface. Well, that's great, but the problem is okay. Let let me let me simplify this for the masses, I guess, and 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 I'll leave out all the tech talk and the specs and all this for a second, and let's just let's get down to basics. What what your average uh, uh, consumer, especially around the holidays, is going to see. They're going to see uh, their, the TV commercials, right? You know, during during their TV shows or whatever reality shows they're watching, they're going to see the uh, the Microsoft Surface commercial, and then they're going to see the iPad commercial, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I assume you've seen both. I have. Okay. Um, when I watch the iPad commercial, uh, what I see is things being done on the iPad. I see people using FaceTime. I see people sending and receiving emails. I see uh, people surfing the internet. I see people taking photos, people doing video editing. Uh, all these fun things I see people doing on this iPad. When I watch the Microsoft Surface commercial, all I see is this little thing flying around the screen with a, with a keyboard attached to it sometime and sometimes not but I don't see anybody actually doing anything on this machine. And so I think they're, they're going about promoting this thing all wrong. They're not showing what you can do with it, and they're also, and, and more to the point, they're not showing what advantages it offers over the iPad, which is what they should be uh, stressing, I think. Well, I think you make a, a great point, um, but I also think part of the problem is that the the only availability, the only places people can see and touch and play with a a Surface device so far has been a Microsoft Store. There's just a handful of those out there. Right. Okay. Between Microsoft Stores and I think they call them Microsoft Kiosks, there's like maybe 30 spots without within North America. Other than that, you have to you know you have to order it off online. Well, do you so, think it would make a difference? Well, you know, I think it was certainly. If I was on the Microsoft side of things, I'd say, you know, look, why we they should have been at Best Buy at the get go. They should right. have already they, I, at, I agree at the very, they should okay. have been there since day one. They, since, since day one. Right. Um and I think they did a really bad job with the distribution. I think they uh overestimated the number of people who would buy a surface online. as a matter of fact, uh, they've cut back their initial order substantially. Right. Uh, now, of course, they just announced the Surface Pro pricing, which uh, really is a thousand dollars. It's what eight ninety nine, but then you got to have the key, the keyboard cover thing. That's going to which I so, think is severely <clears throat> overpriced. Yeah, so that's what another one hundred and twenty bucks. So you're really at a thousand dollars for a Surface. Then the problem with that is you're right in uh, you know ultrabook territory, big time, and right. uh, most people are going to choose a you know a touch screen laptop. Over a Surface, you know, right from the get-go. So I don't, I don't see the Surface Pro being no. successful at all in the marketplace. I, I, I predict it'll be an abject, dismal failure. Uh, and Surface, I'm not saying that it itself will be a failure, but as things go right now, is definitely very, very grim. Let's get to the next point. Okay. 
Number two, employees gradually switch away from using Windows PCs at work. Mm -hmm. Boy, you're seeing that. You're seeing lots. Uh, if if you uh, if you see watch people uh, like downtown. You know, one day I was in downtown Fort Wayne. And I was just kind of people watching that day, mm -hmm. and I and I was amazed at the number of people who were uh, carrying Apple gear like iPhones and that kind of thing around, doing work on them. Uh, they were in the coffee shop with iMac or not iMacs, but you know, MacBook uh, MacBook Airs. MacBook Pros, you've seen a lot of that around there. And these are people working, and they're they're able to do their jobs now thanks to cloud-based you know tools such as Office 365, such as Google Apps, etc. <laughs> that they're less dependent on the old standard Windows PC, you know, the old Wintel thing. They can get real work done on iPads. They can get them done on iPhones, on Android phones. They can get real work done on the Nexus tablets. They don't necessarily have to be tied to a Windows PC. Again, this is bad news when companies are converting Windows-based computers to Macs. A lot of, I think a lot of what you're seeing is a combination of two factors. Uh, one is you have the students uh, that used Macs through co their college years. And, and let, let's face it. Uh, Macs have increased in popularity by something like 60 to 70 percent among college students in the past few years. So you're seeing that those students that are getting out of college and they were used to using Macs all through college, you're, you're having those students now. Now they're working. Now they are the, the, the company leaders. Now they are in those positions and they want to use what they're used to and that'd be a Mac. Okay, that's one thing. Another thing you have now is a smartphone culture that you didn't have 10 years ago. Uh, I mean, let, let's be honest. I mean, yeah, there's been smartphones for over 10 years, but not like there has been an explosion in growth in the past seven to eight years or so, uh, especially with the iPhone and other smartphone technology and the Android devices. Uh, there's just been an explosion in smartphone use, and people are starting to figure out that you can get some basic functionality and some work done from, directly from your smartphone. Like you said, especially with things like... Uh, with Google and uh, with Dropbox and uh, various other, you know, Evernote, um, you know, there there are things you can you can have a smartphone now that's a serious contender in the workplace. So, all right, the next point: Windows 8 fails to stop the iPad. Okay, so the article goes on to say that uh, Windows tablets, which are designed to go head to head with the iPad, um, were non-existent between the dates October the 21st and November the 17th. It also says the sales were down 21% over that period on a year-over-year -year basis. And Piper Jeffrey analyst uh, Gene Munster says he was at a Microsoft store for two hours. Now, this is embarrassing. Two hours on a Black Friday and saw zero Surface sales. Microsoft reportedly cut its Surface order in half, and Balmer said Surface sales were modest. <laughs> uh, two hours. That would be, look how embarrassing that would be. There's only what a handful of Microsoft stores in the country. Right. They never locate them in small little towns. You know, uh, two hours you're in there, and they don't see a single sale of a Surface. This is a clear rejection of Microsoft Surface RT. Well, I, I'll. I'll play devil's advocate a little bit and say that that sample that Munster took is, is you know, it's, it's a very small sample, you have to admit. I agree. I agree. So I, I, I don't know how much you can actually base on that, but I will say it doesn't look good. Um, but you, you're also looking at a brand new product uh, versus a well-established, well-known, very well-known product. I mean, uh, when you say tablet, computer, the uh, the the iPad is ubiquitous. It's it's everything is an iPad. But may, may I ask you this question? Let's go back to day one of the launch of the iPad. Mm -hmm. There were lines out there for this brand new product. Well, and again, that's promotion. That's Apple promotions. What that is. <laughs> I mean, no no one even people really were excited, right? right? They did a great presentation, got everybody whipped up. Yeah. Microsoft didn't do that. No, not at all. And that again, it goes back to that promotion or lack of promotion that uh, I was talking about earlier. Uh, Apple is uh, famous for their, you know, being able to hype an item and, and convince uh, the average person that they really need that item even if they don't. 
and uh, they they're really uh, they're really famous for that. And Microsoft should take a page out of Apple Handbook when it comes to promoting their devices. Uh, and I'm not saying it would I'm not saying it would be the uh, uh, the cure for this, but I'd say it wouldn't hurt. Well, I, definitely you know, the whole idea behind Windows 8, right, was to have one operating system that would run on a tablet, run on a PC, run on a, a, a laptop, run on a desktop, run on a phone. That's the idea. Bad, it was a bad idea to begin with. <clears throat> okay, so we got this bad idea. Mm -hmm. Okay. No one's really sure what the purpose of RT is now. Why not just, you can accomplish the same thing with running uh, Windows 8 Pro. Okay. No. Uh, but the idea was, we'll have this all-in-one operating system, which turns out there is actually two different. The RT is right, you know, right. remarkably different. But to go head-to-head, -head, we got to stop. You know, that was the marching orders. Let's stop these. Uh, uh, let's have this iPad killer. Let's stop them in their tracks. Let's stop the Android tablets. And, uh, and let's and sell these things. And the market so far has been ice cold to Microsoft on this device. Right. And, and that has got to be uh, a pretty severe thing to face. Let's move on. This is huge. This is huge. Little developers start to leave the Microsoft platform. Now, look, that's we all remember Balmer. Remember Balmer up there, developers, developers, developers. Remember that, Jack? Okay. you got to have the apps in order to sell the hardware. The, the, you just do. Mm -hmm. And, well... Although they're not sure this is happening or not, but so far early signs are actually positive for Microsoft because it has over 20,000 uh, uh, apps in the uh, App Store and Windows is only a month old. But at the same time, Microsoft doesn't have a Facebook app uh, for the Surface. And one of the biggest complaints about reviewers has been the lack of good apps for Windows 8. Okay, Windows Phone has over 100,000 apps, but iOS 700,000, 275,000 specifically for the iPad. Now, the more I've dug into this, and I've kind of looked at this, <clears throat> you talk to most developers, most, and they get very excited over iOS. The developers get really excited over iOS. For Windows 8, I hear crickets. Right. Okay, I don't see the excitement being a developer, and I don't see the financial incentive at this point being a Windows 8 uh, developer. And without, the, without these apps, people don't come to the platform. It's unexcusable that uh, Windows 8 didn't ship with a Facebook application, in my opinion. That should have been just as important to have the weather app or anything else installed by default. They got this people app on Windows 8, which is kind of weird to me. I, I don't care for it personally. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's some Facebook-type integration in it. But people want that go right into Facebook. They don't want the other stuff. Right. Okay. And uh, so that's a problem on that. Okay, number five. <laughs> but this just keeps, the hits just keep coming, right? And that is that Windows Phone gets no traction. Despite the Nokia deal, despite the collapse of RIM, although admittedly RIM has not fully collapsed, certainly the, the sharks are circling on that one. Right. And this has happened despite everything Microsoft has tried in the mobile market for the last few years. People just aren't buying Windows Phone. <clears throat> okay, the latest, latest data from IDC says Microsoft has 2% of the global market share, just 2% of the global market share. Let me tell you, this is a true story. I finally know a person that has a window phone. Okay? One you actually person. know someone who owns one. Yes. <laughs> okay. But here's the, here's, the, here's the funny part. It was given to this person. They just gave it to her. The store gave it to her. Take it. Okay? It wasn't, a, it wasn't a great version of the phone, but they just absolutely gave it away to get rid of it. But, yes, I do know one person who has it. The bottom line is, is that for, in the consumer market, Windows Phone is a total non-starter. Right. Yes, there'll be somebody that watches this video go, I own a Windows phone and it's awesome and you're stupid because you know how great it is. Well, the market has spoken on Windows phone and it's a big thumbs down. 
Right. Well, I've I've played with a I've played with a Windows Phone, and that's about the extent of it. Uh, I will say that I like the UI, mm -hmm. and but as far as uh, as far as integration, as far as usability, I have no idea. I, it, like I said, the, the UI is nice, and that's about the extent of it. Um, I think Android and iOS are just too big right now. I mean, there, there's not. I think it's going to take a lot more than what Windows Phone it has to offer to be any competition for them in the foreseeable future. Let's go on to the next one, and that is this is really probably. Uh, understated. Most consumers don't really know about this or maybe even care about this, mm -hmm. but it's huge to Microsoft, and that is that they're, they're one of their core bread and butter products. Okay? It's not Xbox. Okay? It's not the Xbox, folks. It's not, not that at all. It's Microsoft Office. Okay? And guess what? It did 24 billion dollars worth of sales in 2012. 24 with a B, billion. 12 zeros. And guess what? It's becoming less relevant and that's really scary. If Office starts running into problems and sales tank on that, Microsoft has a huge, huge problem. Last year, okay, uh, <laughs> Uh, the, the Business Insider cautioned that uh, Office runs only on Microsoft platforms and the Mac. But as more employees start to use non-Windows smartphones, iPads, other Android devices to get work done, as we was talking about, and Office not being there, bad news. Now, the death of Office has not happened, but uh, companies are trying. You know, Google Docs, is doing a reasonably good job. There's all kinds of other alternatives. I don't know what's going on with Apple and iWork. Boy, everybody's raising hell about that. It's been uh, the last major update to iWork was in 2009. I don't know whether Apple's give up on the product or what's going on. I'm, I'm seeing uh, you're talking about people trying to, uh, and I'll, I'll address the Apple situation in a second. But uh, as far as people trying to get away from Microsoft Office, I'm seeing a lot of that. Uh, just in my day-to-day -day business, uh, when I set up new systems, used to, well, I'd say three to four years ago, uh, when I would set up new systems for a small office, one of the first requirements would be, okay, we have to have Microsoft Office installed. That would be one of the first one of the first requirements, and they would either provide the disk or I would order the disk uh, directly and uh, install with their operating system. And uh, now I'm seeing. Uh, uh, a big shift in you know lately especially people are saying uh, listen is there anything you can recommend that can get us off of Microsoft Office I've been asked this probably a half a dozen times in just in the past few months is there anything that that uh, we can that you can provide or any software you can recommend that can get us off of Microsoft Office and uh, you know, and, and I'll recommend some free software occasionally I've recommended Google Docs a few times or Google uh, Google Apps a few times. Uh, there was one situation where I recommended LibreOffice, and uh, it, it worked out fine for what they needed. And you know that's a free office suite. There's always Open Office. Uh, the thing is, people are trying. People are trying to get away from Microsoft Office. I'm seeing a shift in it, and there's several reasons for that. Uh, one of which is has always been price. Uh, of course, lately, you know, there are some alternatives, but the, the, just the cost itself, Microsoft knew what they had. They had this juggernaut, and the price seemed like it just kept going up and up and up and up. Yeah. And I think it, it really got to the point where people are just fed up, and they're like, listen, I don't want to be, uh, I don't want to be shackled to this particular software anymore. Well, you know, Jack, the reality is, is you know, I know plenty of people still using, like, Office 2007. Oh, I'll still use Office 2007. Okay, and there was no compelling reason to really upgrade no. to Office 2010. No. There was no real compelling reason to upgrade to Office 2013 because Office 20, 2007 does exactly what they need. Exactly. Uh, look, there's only so many. I mean, most people use a fraction of the features of this 800-pound gorilla of Office productivity. I'm, I'm one of them. I'm one of them. I use I'm, I'm saying here. I'm, I'm saying here. But, you know, certainly there are people are. But here's what I find. I find that... 
uh, offices, especially smaller offices or most offices, could get by with something for most users like uh, Google Docs, for example, mm -hmm. or the web-based version of Word on uh, Office 365. Right. And only a few people would need an actual full-blown copy of Microsoft this, uh, Office in there, maybe because they're doing advanced mail merge and formatting and that kind of thing that the web apps just can't handle. Those people are few and far between. They really are. Uh, and, and companies are beginning to figure that, like, my God, we're spending thousands of dollars a year in, in licensing of these products, and people aren't using the features. And it's not just, it's not just, uh, it's, a, it's a general change of attitude, and I'm seeing it across the board, not just in Microsoft Office. I'm also seeing it in things like Adobe Photoshop and things like that. People are asking, hey, can I, I heard about this GIMP program. Can I do what I have to do at my job with this program? And, you know, you're, you're trying to save five or $600. Well, it's the same thing. People are getting more and more frugal, um, and they're, they're, just, they're getting to the point now where they're, they're starting to ask questions. Do we really need to be locked into this software? Do we really need to spend four or five hundred dollars on this suite of applications where we're only going to use maybe, you know, maybe ten percent of the features? Or can this, we get something else? This leads us into the next point, which is if Office starts to fade away, if Windows starts to fade away then there's less reasons to adopt other Microsoft technologies such as Exchange Server for email, uh, Link for, uh, SharePoint Server for collaboration, Link for video conferencing, uh, Dynamics for CRM and accounting, and on and on and on. Exchange, SharePoint, Dynamics all bring in more than a billion dollars a year. And Link is Microsoft's fastest growing business application. Now, so here's this whole domino effect. So if you think about it, <clears throat> Windows is the foundation that Microsoft's empire is built upon. And then Office is almost think of it like a layer cake. Mm -hmm. The bottom layer is Windows. Right. The next layer is going to be Office, and the next layer is going to be things like Exchange, SharePoint, Link, all this other stuff, okay? Uh -huh. Uh, and that is how this cake is made. Well, if we start yanking away the foundation of the bottom layer of the cake, what happens? The whole thing topples over. Mm -hmm. And that is exactly what we're seeing um, going uh, uh, happening now with Microsoft. And that has got to be an extremely scary thing. Again, we are a business technology show. That's what we talk about. I think a lot of people that tune in and watch the YouTube videos or listen to the podcast <clears throat> really get hung up over the, over the whole thing about, you know, Xbox, and they get hung up about, you know, Windows 8 and playing video games and all that. That is not where Microsoft's money comes from. It's really not, folks. It's not where they make their dough. They make their dough selling lots of software licenses to big companies who buy hundreds of thousands of computers and licenses of Office at 400 bucks a pop. You know, where they're doing in the billions of dollars worth of business there. Okay? And that's what makes all this relevant. Microsoft has can afford misadventures such as Zune and, and all the <laughs> other stuff that they've had because they absorb that through the, the uh, just incredible amount of money they make on the business side of things for Microsoft. They are an enterprise company, and we're, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Pretty amazing stuff. Number eight, and this is what I just talked about, the platform business collapses. That's servers and tools. What is servers and tools? Servers and tools basically consists of things like Windows 8, uh, Windows 2008 Server, mm -hmm. uh, System Center, uh, all the other stuff, Exchange, SharePoint, their Dynamics product lines, all these, all these product lines that are, are uh, that establish that Windows platform in a business and in the enterprise, all these supporting players. Uh, you know, SQL Server is not sexy. Most consumers uh, have no idea what SQL Server is, what it does. But it is a database is, at its heart and soul. It is a relational database that powers 
a lot of Microsoft products in the back end you don't see it you don't actually interface with SQL Server some people call it SQL but, but SQL Server you really don't interface with it directly you normally interface with it through an application like a web app or uh, some other accounting application whatever and, and that application is what talks back and forth with that <clears throat> this thing is expensive it run, can run in the tens of thousands of dollars a license uh, because of the way that Microsoft does it so if if I yank out that Windows platform, right, that bottom layer, then everything again begins to collapse. The need for platform, these servers and tools divisions will also suffer the consequences. So little by little, as this thing erodes, you start, see, you start seeing the whole uh, doggone thing collapsing, which is unfortunate because some of this is really good stuff. By the way, I happen to be a big fan of SQL Server. And uh, it's uh, very powerful, and and certainly, bef it, it, you know what? I'll give Microsoft credit because uh, I don't know if you're familiar with a company called Oracle, Jack. Mm -hmm. But Oracle databases power, you know, like the big databases that track airline schedules and that kind of thing. These are huge, right. huge databases that require lots of power. Their stuff is. Out of the ungodly expensive, <laughs> you know, in the millions of dollars when you buy an Oracle system. And Microsoft came along and they brought most of the power, not all, but most of the features and power of or, you know, Oracle database to the PC world, to the smaller enterprises, made it affordable, made this technology affordable. God bless them, they did it. And they deserve kudos for doing that. But again, they kind of made up for some of this through having that whole Windows and Microsoft infrastructure in some place because we were not only selling you a database, but we're going to sell you the other tools as well and make money over the long haul. And then that's disappearing. This we, we can actually see these things beginning to happen. That's that's very very disheartening. I think uh, these are some of the. These are some of the nightmares coming true I think, for I think some of these things are putting uh, putting Microsoft into panic mode, and Microsoft does not do well when they're put into panic mode. Historically, they just don't do well. Uh, let, let, let me say this. As far as uh, the products go, uh, like you said, it's a domino effect um, with, you know, you have Office and you have the platform at the bottom, and you work your way up. But Office is one of the biggest, one of the biggest, if not the biggest thing holding Microsoft up. Okay, and you you said yourself you're still using uh, Office 2007, correct? Well, I no, I said I know people that you still you know people that do right, and I still use uh, I still I have use 2010. Right, I'm still using 2007. It does everything I need it to do. Right. Uh, my wife and her school, her school still uses Office 2007. They have no reason to upgrade. I have no reason to upgrade since Office uh, 2007 does everything. I, you know, I could probably get by with 2003 if it would export in the correct format. Um, but after 2007, did they build in any features into Microsoft Office to make it a compelling upgrade? Was there I don't think so. I, 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 nothing I, that I, I don't, don't, no, nothing really stands out. I didn't see any compelling features in uh, 2010. I didn't see any compelling features in the latest version to make me want to upgrade to, uh, or, or especially if you're looking at a company that has to come up with the money for all these, you know, these licenses. Uh, you have to, you have to show these companies some compelling features in this new software to make them want to upgrade. Well, as a matter of fact, Jack, I think one of the things they did between 2007 and 2010 is what? The ribbon. The whole ribbon interface thing. Right. Well, and that, yeah. how useful was that for people? You know, people had to relearn how to use Office because they knew their way around the menus that well, they had. And that's the thing. I mean, then they changed it again. I mean, they went, yeah. to, the, they went to the ribbon interface in 2007. And I, I had just gotten used to the ribbon interface, and then they come up with 2010, and they changed it again. Well, I had just started getting used to this ribbon interface, and then you go and change it on me again. There was no need for it. And that, that brings me to another point, which is Windows itself. Uh, Windows 8. Okay, there's your platform. What are the compelling features of Windows 8 
to make me want to jump from Windows 7, which is a very rock solid, very stable operating system that will do everything that I need to do and do it efficiently and quickly, especially if you're looking at if you're looking at an individual, okay? If you're looking at an individual, maybe maybe the novelty of a touch interface, a touch enabled interface will be enough to convince them that it's it's worth the upgrade. Okay, you're only looking at forty to fifty bucks. Maybe an individual you can understand that. But if you're looking at if you're looking at an entire company switching over from Windows Seven or even Windows Vista to Windows Eight, what are the compelling reasons to get them to do that? What can Windows Eight offer me? that Windows 7 wasn't already doing and doing better and now that I have this completely new interface I'm gonna to have to go back and retrain all my employees to use it. No, I'm, I'm, I hear you on that point. Uh, remember we did do a show we had uh, right. uh, Brian on uh, and we that, talked and about some of the benefits of point. When you, when and he's you, saying you know, we said that his customers that actually installed it learned to like it or they liked it and I, I won't dispute that with right. him, and I'm not disputing that as an individual but I'm disputing I'm disputing companies adopting the new I, 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 I I'm with you on that I, I don't see I, that's really not going to happen anytime soon and you have to and you have to convince that that's the thing you have to convince the major players that the product that you're introducing now is better than the product they're already using and if you can't do that then you just lost a customer that's, that's the bottom line and they're they're doing that with their operating system and they're doing it with Microsoft Office we're gonna take it a step further now I'm gonna go a step further we're gonna throw Xbox into the mix you know that's been seemingly the bright spot of the Microsoft Empire Right. Is that Microsoft Xbox 360 has still been relatively well selling device? Right. Okay. It's and the they've done a pretty good job getting it into a lot of living rooms out there. But right. here, here comes the rub. Last year, Microsoft had $21 billion in operating income last year. Wow, that's a lot of money. Only 364 million of it came from Xbox. That's that is a fraction, <laughs> and I mean an insignificant fraction. That that's actually surprising to me. It shouldn't be. Why is that? Because it's very expensive to produce. Right. The marketing is horrendously overpriced. There is a. It's a basically a loss leader from Microsoft. It's mm -hmm. not a money maker. People, you know, this console has been around forever. Engineering a new one is going to cost a, just a buttload more money. The R&D right. that's involved in it. Uh, there's been some resurgence in PC gaming. I'm not a gamer. I, I'm not really qualified to talk that intelligently about gaming other than to say I prefer gaming on an Xbox as I do to a PC. That's just what I happen to like. Some people like it on a PC. I get that, but for me, Xbox is the way to play games. You know, I, I don't. Here's here's the thing. I think Microsoft has done a very good job of promoting the Xbox. They have done a better job at promoting the Xbox than anything else they have ever done by far, or everything they else they've ever done combined. In my opinion, they've done a better job promoting the Xbox, but. How many people out there, if you talk to the average person, even knows that the Xbox has anything to do with Microsoft at all? Most people have no idea that the Xbox is even made by Microsoft. If you talk to the average teenager, they don't even they don't even connect the two. I, I've said this before, and I will say it again. One of the things that Microsoft should do, okay, is to spin off spin off what they call entertainment devices which mm -hmm. is the Xbox, it's the mice, the keyboards, everything consumer based hardware products. Right. That should be spun off to its own separate company. I agree. Okay. I agree. And, uh, uh, and that would indeed be most helpful to the, the Microsoft stock. Okay. I'm going to wrap up this segment of the show then and uh, you know, the question is, okay, so all these things coming to pass, it would seem like this would be an ideal opportunity for the board of directors to sit down and show Mr. Ballmer the door. 
<clears throat> is we got to get you out of here so there's a Microsoft five years from now. I agree with you. I think that um, I, I think that for Microsoft to make it out of this uh, slump that they're in, I, I think they have to do well. They have to do a multitude of things, but I think the two mo well the three most important things that they could do: one, show Bomber the door; two, they're going to have to, like you said, divide the company up. You have your entertainment division with the Xbox, etc., on this side and you have your operating system and Microsoft Office, your software division on this side, okay? I, I say take it a step further, Jack. <laughs> I say spin off. That means literally no, cut agree. off Xbox. I agree. Say you're your own separate gig. I we'll agree. sell stock in that company and it'll right. make money or it'll lose money. But we're not pulling out of here to prop right. that up. And I'll say one other thing. They need to get back to what made them Microsoft to begin with they need to get back to doing a good operating system. Let's try that for a change. Let's try doing a decent operating system for a change instead of something new and radical. How about just making what you have better and more usable? Let's try that. That's a novel idea. I agree. I agree. Well, the only way it's not going to happen in the near term. I, I, this is not. They're not going to get rid of Bomber in the near term unless, of course, they were to have several quarters of substantial losses. Which I can see coming. Okay. Once that occurs, once they see, you mean we didn't get our customary $8 billion in, in income this quarter? Right. And we actually lost money? That's when, that's when I think the board will get really, really serious. Right now I think it's <clears throat> more of a, I actually need to do some digging into the, the board members. I know who a few of them are. And they pretty much rubber stamp these, the Gates and, and Balmer show. Because Bill Gates still has an active voice uh, in the running of Microsoft. Even though he's mostly occupied with the Gates Foundation, he still he has... Be, he can't be happy with the way things are going. Oh, but he's going to stand behind Steve because they have this you know, decades-old relationship. Over right. 30 years they've, they've been together. But uh, it's really going to take a couple quarters of some pretty significant losses at this point for Microsoft to get rid of Steve Ballmer. So, right. And those are uh, those are nightmare scenarios right there. Let's you you know Jack, I uh, I today I published a blog article, I did a YouTube video about Google dropping the free version of Google Apps. Now, why is that even newsworthy? Uh, and I'll tell you why. Um, I happen to know a number of small businesses that use Google Apps. In particular, they this is the free version that they use. All right. Uh, before we went live, you had mentioned also about having some customers that you've talked to about Google Apps and so forth. Right. And you can't beat the entry uh, fee of being free. To get started, because you know, a startup, uh, mom and pops, companies with four or five, ten employees, they don't have a lot of money, generally speaking. And uh, times are tight. Times, times are tight. Times, but they want, but and they need professional business class tools. They need business class email. They need a way to share documents, maybe back and forth with one another. They need a way to communicate with one another. Uh, they got to have these tools, and. Uh, Google Apps, the free version, was uh, notice past tense uh, was was wonderful. So I did a blog article, to, and I thought long and hard about the title, and I probably changed the title half a dozen times before I finally posted the thing. But it was called Five Reasons Why Google Will Ruin Google Apps," and I wanted to just kind of talk about this for a few minutes. And, and when I say ruin Google Apps, I don't necessarily mean ruin the way it works or how it performs. What I mean is ruining the brand. Mm -hmm. The Google Apps brand is what I'm really referring to. Now, I started out with Google Apps. I actually, when I first started this company, Jack, I started with my own small business server. It was a small business server 2003. And I had Exchange on there. and I, Then I installed Microsoft CRM and 
I had all kinds of stuff on this woefully underpowered server. It was a miracle the thing even ran. It <laughs> had SQL on it, Microsoft CRM Exchange. I had SharePoint going, all this on this pitiful, pitiful server. But that's another story. I, the thing was, you know, working on servers and all that uh, really isn't what how I make my money. And so one day I said, you know what, this is ridiculous. I don't want to sit there and worry about rebuilding Exchange database anymore. I don't want to do any of this kind of stuff. I'm going to get a hosted version of Exchange. Okay? And I think that occurred in 2009, early 2009. And I found a hosting company that for the hosted exchange, and uh, they also had a hosted version of CRM. Unfortunately, I made a bad decision what the company I chose to host this stuff with. They were very unprofessional, um, uh, for nice people, nice people, but really didn't get the small business guy, and their support was just horrid with this thing. And it got to the point where I'm pulling my hair out. Try to, certain parts of it wouldn't the CRM wouldn't work. They couldn't fix it. They weren't able to figure out how to upgrade with the next generation come on. All the advantages of having a host had just dissipated before my very eyes. <laughs> you know, I, I so I've got to get away from these guys. I just do. Well, the long story short, um, you know, I've talked to some other friends and everything. Said, look, you've got to try Google Apps for Business. You just do. It's free. Mm -hmm. Go for it. And I and I and I looked it over and I said, okay, I feel comfortable in in pulling the plug and uh, moving over to Google Apps. And I never regretted that I did that. And when I did at the time, you could have up to 50 user accounts free. This would have cost me quite a bit of money. The same amount of accounts with this hosted exchange provider, mm -hmm. uh, quite a bit. And here, this was free. And the anti-spam on it works pretty decent because they had some. You know, just your basic Gmail has pretty decent anti-spam filtering. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, just basic Gmail. Just the basic's pretty good. You know, but I had, you know, the, the free service, and I think, what do you get, like five gigabytes of storage, uh, mail yeah, storage? I believe, uh, I think Five or ten, maybe? Five or seven, I, I believe. Maybe it is seven. So that would seem to be sufficient. Uh, of course, you don't get things like 24/7 support. You don't get the 90, the, the, the you know the 99.99 percent uptime guarantee, the SLA on it. Because uh, there's there's two versions. There's the free version and the paid version, mm -hmm. right? And the paid version basically gets you 25 gigabyte, uh, gigabytes of email storage. Storage. Mm -hmm. uh, it gives you the 24/7 support phone number. It gives you the 99. Uh, 0.99% SLA service level agreement is what it means, uh, and then also access to tools to integrate or a kind of trick Outlook to think it's working with the Exchange Server that you don't get with the free version. So there's a, a number of things, uh, the benefits to the paid version, but the the free version works, man, and it gets small businesses off the ground and gets them up and going. And I liked it so much that a year ago. I thought, you know what, I want to build a practice around Google Apps. I'm really getting into the Google ecosystem. I'm starting to learn the Google App Engine and, and App Script, and I'm looking at all the, the you know the third-party tools that integrate with in that whole Google ecosystem. I can see, I can see Google having this tremendous ecosystem all the way around it. Mm -hmm. And I thought. There's a real business opportunity to get in there and learn all this stuff and spread the Google gospel. There's also not as many uh, resellers, Google certified uh, authorized resellers out there. There's this whole army that Microsoft has. Right. It's like a hundred to one ratio. You know, I'm I could get in on this thing relatively ground floor. Um, and I really thought very very seriously about that. But um, and then. In April of last year, there's we get notified that Google is cutting that 50 free account down to 10. Now, I was grandfathered in. I still get to keep my 50. I'm good. But anybody new coming on could only have 10 free user accounts. So I thought, well, you know, 50 was a pretty generous amount because mostly it's startups and really small businesses. That's 10 is doable for a lot of little businesses getting started. Right. But then you hear this last weekend, you know, 
we get an email or yeah saying guess what it goes away we're done we're done with the free version mm -hmm. and I thought man this I, I came up with five different reasons why I again it's not that it's going to ruin the pro the way it works but it's going to ruin the, the the Google Apps brand and the first reason I give is I say that the freemium business model works on software it works it's demonstrated to work there's I mean you look at half of these successful apps on the uh, App Store and the Apple world they're freemium products and they work uh, I know the president of a pretty substantial software company who loves the freemium model because why it works mm -hmm. um, and Google is in this really big battle right now with Microsoft it's, it's a huge battle right now and they're trying to win the hearts and minds of, of businesses everywhere, all over the globe. <clears throat> and one of the ways Google does is say, look, we have over 4 million businesses that use Google Apps. 4 million. Right. 40 million people sit down every day and use Gmail and they use Google Docs. They use all these wonderful tools. 40 million. I don't know anyone who doesn't use Gmail. Okay. Well, it's a very impressive number. Right. That's a very impressive number, and the more people who use Gmail and use Google, and they, they know how it works, and they're familiar with it, and they feel pretty good about it, okay? But what Google doesn't say is that most of those 4 million companies are using the free version, mm -hmm. okay? They're not saying that. Um, so that being the case, if... Now, if new companies come there and start knocking on Google's door and saying, well, we're sorry, you can't play for free anymore, now there's a dilemma. Now they're gonna, there's alternatives out there that didn't really exist like they do today. One of them is Office 365. It's the first one I'm going to throw out there. Mm -hmm. Okay, because Google's saying now, it's, hey, it's 50 bucks a year per user. And Microsoft's saying, hey, we're $72 a year per user. Right. Okay. And they're going to say, well, we know Microsoft, and we know how Outlook works. It's a more established brand. It's more established, and maybe we'll just spend the extra money and go the Microsoft route. Mm -hmm. we got to pay for this stuff. We, must just, we know Microsoft. We know that name, and Microsoft means business. And we're also sure about the – yeah, you can get a 30-day free trial at Google Apps. Most people don't want to jump through that. They don't want to do the free trial and all that. They just go for it. They stick with what they know. <clears throat> they stick with what they know. Uh, and so that's the first reason right there is uh, this is stupid. By taking away the free model, you're going to alienate new companies coming in and using Google Apps. You're always going to have attrition on the back end, the companies that leave the Google app, uh, app ecosystem. And eventually that number of 4 million companies using Google Apps may shrink to 3 million, may shrink to 2.5 million. Because they're not getting all these. Uh, if you want to call us freeloaders, that's fine. You, your, your party, your game, whatever you want to call us. If you want to get rid of us freeloaders out there, well, you're going to have to suffer the consequences. You're not going to get. You're going to give up some of those bragging rights to your brand about how large you are. So that was my first reason. You can call it freeloading if you want to, but it gets people in the door. It, that's the point. That's, that's how the freemium model works. If, if any, if any, you know, if you ask any business, any retail business, especially, uh, what's the most important thing that you can do? It's get people get in, them in the door, right? You can get them in the door. You can right. sell them something. Okay, so let's talk about that a little bit. Okay, reason number two: Microsoft Office has become a real and viable alternative to Google Apps. Again, at that seventy-two dollar a year uh, year per user price point. Not that dramatically higher. Office 365 gives you a host exchange. Everybody knows exchange is the gold standard in business class email. Mm -hmm. Okay. You get shared calendaring, shared contacts. You get instant messaging. You get a team website like SharePoint for collaborating documents, etc. These are all business class tools. They work really, really reliable. You get the Microsoft name. You get that Microsoft name. You get their... A financial incentive to use your tools, all that sort of thing. So now I'm looking, all things being equal, now you're pushing me uh, to consider another brand. The Microsoft product is looking a lot better. Looking a lot better. Reason number three, okay, <clears throat> and that is that Google Apps is fantastic 
at that free that freemium model. Okay, but guess what? As a paid subscription, it's got to improve, man. And I don't mean in a little way. I mean in a big, big way. Okay, Google cannot seriously tell me that I can do everything I need to do in a browser at this point. Right. Now I can do a lot of what I need to do, but I can't necessarily do everything. Okay. Well, they have there's a, there's uh, goofy thing there's goofy things in Google Apps that simply don't work right. They they have an entire <clears throat> operating system designed around it, so that that's where they're trying to go with it. But like okay. you said, it, it it can stand a lot of improvement. Okay, it can stand a lot of. Uh, it is not a viable replacement product for the full blown Microsoft Office suite. Right. It's just not there yet. No. Okay. You want, and I've got a couple examples. It, this is just a couple of basic things. These are a couple of basic things that Google Docs doesn't do. Mm -hmm. Sit down and have somebody take a Google document and say, I want you to do a mail merge of 25 personalized uh, letters to people. Mm -hmm. Show me how you do it. Can it be done? Yes, it can. Can it be done as easily or elegantly as you can in Microsoft Office? No, you cannot. Right. You've got to load up a spreadsheet. You've got to load up a script. You've got to copy, get contacts over into I, it. You, I can it, give you a more, more simple example than that. It's just opening up a, uh, an Office document. Thank you. Thank it, you. That was my second example, and that's what we call fidelity. Just as simple as that, I, I can't tell you the number of times I've gotten calls where people would open up their Office document and that they created with their home version of Microsoft Office. When they open it up in their Google Apps, well, it looks different. It's not the same. Yeah, exactly. That's what we call fidelity. Right. Okay, and that's a big, big issue. That, that is a major issue. You that's have a showstopper for it, some it, people. Exactly. Well, and, and, and it is. I've had a couple of people actually say, well, listen, I'm just going to have to get Microsoft Office at work because I can't do this. You know, they have maybe four to five systems at work, so I set them up with Google Apps uh, because, I, you know, the investment just didn't make sense. And they were fine with it. But then, uh, like I said, they have Office back home. They try to do their work at home, drop it in the drive, pick it up at work, and it just didn't look right. And they said, look, I can't have that. I can't spend half my day correcting correcting this document. It just, you know, it's, it's, it's not practical. I'll give you my fourth reason. And that is, is that in any Office suite, we're pretty hard-pressed to use all the features that come with them. Okay? And when people sign up for Google Apps, the, generally what they're after to begin with, and mostly, is Gmail. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then they may move on to start experimenting maybe a little bit with Google Docs, which is now Google Drive. They might try their hand at maybe the forms a little bit. But a lot of the features, maybe like Google Talk, they're not going to use. They probably may not use, you know, the circles and the hangouts and all the other stuff that, Google keeps piling onto this thing right. because they're really not interested in it. And if they say to themselves in the very beginning, very upfront, they go, "Well, we know we're we need the email. We know we need to share some documents. We know we need to chat back and forth. Couldn't we do that through a combination of the email service we already got through our ISP, which we don't pay for, Skype, uh, Skype for instant message, and uh, maybe Dropbox for." sharing documents back and forth. Maybe we don't have to invest anything at all. Maybe we'll just use the tools we already got. Right. Uh, maybe if we need a more heavy-duty uh, productivity suite, we'll get LibreOffice. Right. We'll load it up on a few machines. Everybody else, you know, mm -hmm. uh, we'll, we'll figure something out. We'll use open source software for that. We don't have to pay a penny for anything at that point. We already... We're already paying for an ISP to host our website. We get our domain, so we get 35, 50 email addresses anyway. Why bother dinking around with sending it to there, you know? So that is, <clears throat> I'm telling you, that's a legitimate thing. Mm -hmm. That would be something that, that there's no winners, really, at that point. So that leads me to my final reason of the five reasons which is that Google is an advertising company. Okay, Microsoft started out for making business software. It's all they do. That's all they know. It's all pretty much they're an expert in this area. 
Google started out as search. Then they figured out how to monetize search, and they took that cash hoard, and they started building other tools that they thought could help their search business. <clears throat> the free version of Google Apps, guess what it does? When, you, when you're typing emails and you're reading emails and you're creating documents, that kind of thing, uh, hang on just a second. The phone's ringing at a bad time. Not a problem. I'll get this taken care of. Okay. Okay. There we go. Um, oh. There we go. Uh, but they're a search company. And so all these products uh, amplify the search uh, product. <clears throat> and when it's a free version of Google Docs, it's looking at the parsing the emails and so forth, trying to present you with advertising that you might find relevant. You see, you are the product in Google land. You are the product, okay? And guess what? We kind of halfway acknowledge that. And if you don't believe me, by the way, about the ownership of your documents that Google actually owns, them, look at the term of service. It's right there. It's all real scary stuff, what they can and cannot do. But because we're getting these cool services for free, we kind of turned a blind eye to it and kind of pretend it's not there just so we can get all this cool stuff for free. But if we're going to pay for it, Excuse me again. We're having technical difficulties here. We are, yes, we are. <laughs> okay, there we go. Well, you know what? I, I, I have my cell phone on the charger in here in the, where we record the show, and I wasn't expecting to call this. But hey, hey, Bruce, you see this little button on the side right here? Yeah. Yeah, if you flip that. <laughs> Thanks, for that right <laughs> Thanks for the reminder. I will, I will do that. <laughs> That will be, yeah, I need to make myself a little checklist before we go. <laughs> I absolutely forgot about the phone being on the charger, and I had it sitting on my my, my tower. But, no, but, but at any rate, that, um, <coughs> uh, so that being the case, if you're considering you got to pay for the service, uh, Google does have some pretty scary terms of service, What they, well, who owns what and control of your data. You are the product with Google. They are a search company. That's what they are. <clears throat> and uh, uh, this whole thing is the whole purpose behind Google Apps uh, wasn't. It was designed to drive ad revenue. Okay, let's just get right to cut to the chase. Everything Google does is designed to ultimately increase their advertising revenue because that's the business they're in. It's just the way they're going about doing it. Okay. I think at the end of the day, they're going to have to, uh, as far as Google Apps goes, if they're going to do this and if they're going to do paid only, they're going to have to change their business model in regards to, uh, uh, they're going to have to completely change their business model on that end. Either that or create two separate factions there and have a different business model. Because well, I, what, they're, what they're trying to do now, just it's not going to work when people start having, when everyone, just to play, you have to pay. It's not going to work. It's not. I I agree with you. I'm hoping that we're going to see radical improvements in the product. Well, and that's and, another thing too. And, and maybe that is what's going to happen. But Google shouldn't be playing it so close to the chest. Well, that's see that bad. several things are going to have to change. One, their uh, their EULA is going to have to change. Okay, the the privacy agreement that you mm -hmm. signed. Mm -hmm. If I'm going to pay for it, I better be the sole owner of those documents if I'm paying for this. Exactly. They, it's got to change. They, they should have no say-so whatsoever. You can offer the service, and that's fine, but you should have no say-so. The service is going to have to get a whole lot better. And the There's going to be a lot more features added to it. It's right, and I, I think what they need to do, they need to get back to basics, like I was saying with Microsoft. With Google, they're going to have to get back to basics. They're going to have to quit adding features like voice and, and other things. Uh, uh, that a lot of people don't even use. They're going to have to get back to basics and say, okay, why is this Microsoft Office document not not uh, opening up properly? Inside, it's got to be fixed. Why? That's why is that to be fixed? Let's fix this. And and what you were talking about, they're going to have to instead of it being a convoluted, multi-step you know process of getting something to work, it's just going to have to work. Period and work the first time. And they need to get away from all these extra features. It seems like every few weeks they're adding in something new, something revolutionary, something different. How about just getting back to basics and making sure the stuff you already hit for the past five years works? Exactly. Thank you very much for that because you're exactly right on that comment. And you know what? 
man, uh, we're we're out of time for this this week's episode, and oh, it was awesome. it was a it was a pleasure. Time does fly. I want to thank everybody for stopping by and visiting with us and watching this show. Remember, you can find us on Podomatic. We're uh, uh, Frugal Tech on Podomatic. We're on iTunes, Business Computing Weekly. Check it out. Make sure uh, you check out Jack. Uh, he's on YouTube as well. What and your are your YouTube channel is is it Dragon Ball Jiu Jitsu? Dragon Ball Jiu Jitsu on on YouTube. And you have a website, Jack. You do, don't you? You have a company website. I do have a website. I will be posting the link to the site in my uh, on my channel actually. So. Let's make sure that happens. And everybody, have a great week weekend, what's left of it. We'll see you next Sunday on Business Computing Weekly, everybody. Take care. Have a great one. Bye-bye.